Merry Christmas Eve. I can't think of a better place to be on Christmas Eve than church. And so on behalf of my family, Tracy, Braden, Elliot, we just want to say thank you for being here today. Merry Christmas to everyone, and we love you so much. I want to say a big thank you. Matter of fact, I think you'd like to join me helping me say thank you to all of these people who have made every Sunday in December just spectacular. Our choir, our worship team, our band, our media team, all the dream team volunteers. Come on, would you let them know how much you appreciate the great, great job they have done each and every Sunday. It has been the, the best December we've ever had at our church. Just record numbers of people coming to church, people coming to faith in Christ. How many know that's what it's all about? And so thank you for, for being here today. We're going to receive our offering now, so I want to encourage our uh, ushers in to, to get ready and everybody to prepare to give in the offering today. So thank you so much for, for your giving and for your faithfulness, especially those of you that have already given online. We appreciate that so much. While you're preparing to give, let me remind you that there's not going to be a service this Wednesday, and there, we're going to resume our Tuesday morning prayer uh, as part of 21 days of prayer, so we won't be gathering for prayer this Tuesday or the following Tuesday, okay? So just so you guys know, we'll still be praying for you, but we won't be here on Tuesday morning at 6 o'clock, okay? So thank you so much for doing that. I did a little research, and I found some interesting statistics. Did you know that nearly one-third of all giving occurs in December? Think about that for a second. When we talk about nonprofits, churches, things like that, nearly one-third of all giving occurs in December. And did you know that 12% of all giving happens the last three days of the year? Now, what that means is this is a great time to give, right, to, to the Lord and to the church. And so uh, I wonder why that is. Well, we know some of it has to do with taxes. And by the way, with the new tax law, there's a good opportunity for a lot of people to make contributions to uh, churches like ours. And if you give, we promise to put it to good use, to invest in people's lives, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in our community and around the world. Uh, but, but ultimately, the reason is, is Christmas. It's because of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he, that he gave. And so when we give, we are being like Jesus. And so God has given us so much, we return our gifts out of gratitude to the Lord. Is anybody here grateful today for the greatest gift of all time, the gift of love, the gift of peace, the gift of salvation, Jesus Christ? Amen. And a couple of weeks ago, we received our Christmas offering and so thank you so much for everybody who has given. Uh, by the way, we've had record participation in the, in the Christmas offering. It's our year-end offering. And we're going to let you know two weeks from today uh, the results of that Christmas offering. And the reason we're waiting is because we're giving everybody the opportunity to give in the Christmas offering all the way up till December 31st. Okay, so you have uh, about a week left to do that. You can do it today if you want. You can do it at home, online if you want to do that. But we'd like everybody to give in the Christmas offering. We're starting a ministry project in Ramla, Israel. We're upgrading our food pantry here and addressing our missions deficit here with the Christmas offering. And so thank you so much for your giving. And so thank you for the, uh, for the generosity that you are showing this year at Christmas. So ushers, go ahead and usher away. Thank you so much for your participation here this, this morning. Now, Today, as we, as we begin our message, we've been talking about this idea of Christmas revolution. How many know Jesus did not come to start a religion? He came to start a revolution. I love Christmas. Anybody love Christmas? I love it. I, 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 love, I love all of the things about Christmas. I especially love the food profile pic here. Come on, somebody. I've had more sugar in the last seven days than I have in the last seven months. Can I get a witness in the house of God? And it feels good. Come on, 21 days of prayer and fasting, somebody said, right? Now, one of the best things I love about Christmas is the songs of Christmas. I love the songs of Christmas. I did a little research, and I found the top five Christmas songs, according to Billboard magazine. And so here's number five. Holly Jolly Christmas. Of course, it's by Burl Ives. 
And number four is the Christmas song by Nat King Cole. Chestnuts roasting. Number three is It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. And, of course, Andy Williams has to sing it. Number two is Rocking Around the Christmas Tree. Now, before we show you number one, don't show number one. Take a guess what number one is. You might want to take a guess. Just shout it out. It's a Pentecostal church. All right. All right. Here's number one. Ready? All I want for Christmas. Mariah Carey. As the groan settles over the crowd. Wow. Now, I think this list illustrates the disconnect between the revolutionary story of Christmas and what we have made it to be. Because none of these songs have anything to do with Jesus. Are you getting this? In fact, many of the songs we sing at Christmas just don't make sense. Do you ever think about the words that you sing? 12 days of Christmas. Remember, he's sending gifts to his true love. But if you count up all the days, that means he sent his true love 184 birds. How many know that's grounds for breaking up right there? Um, Silent night, holy night. Come on now. Do you really believe that baby Jesus didn't cry? Loudly? All right, that's a call from the nursery. They need some volunteers to help them out, all right? Now, how many know anybody who's ever had a newborn knew that it was anything but a silent night? All right. Um, here's the song, Do You Hear What I Hear? Now, listen, listen to the words. Do you know what I know? A child, a child shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Now, how many know if a child is shivering in the cold, the last thing you bring him is metal? <laughs> bring him a blanket, some wood for a fire. You know, and it goes on to say, said the night wind to the little lamb. Do you hear what I hear? Now, listen, if you think the night wind and the little lamb are talking to you, chances are you're the only one hearing what you're hearing. <laughs> Isn't that right? Songs are a big part of the Christmas story. As a matter of fact, in the Christmas story, there are at least four songs in the gospel, in response to the message of Jesus coming to us. And these songs are revolutionary songs that when you look at them, you see how revolutionary they are, particularly in the context of the culture and the world in which they live. And so for the next few moments, I want to look at the four revolutionary songs of Christmas, okay? And here's the first one. The first one is Mary's song, and we're calling it the Song of Praise, in Latin, it's the Magnificat. I did not say Aristocat. Everybody wants to be a cat. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not a Christmas song. And I'm sorry I put that song in your head. All right. It's the song of, of praise. In Luke chapter 1, the angel Gabriel visits Mary, and he gives her good news. Remember, he says, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son and you're going to call him Jesus. He will be great. He'll be the son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. So that was the message that God gave to Mary through Gabriel. But I want you to notice the scripture says that she was troubled by his words. Read it again. He was, she was troubled by his words. Now, you say, well, this was an incredible honor that she was trusted with, but how many know this was still a challenge for her? I'm put yourself in Mary's shoes. She's poor. She's a virgin. She's very, very young. And so this would, this would literally change her life in every way. So she goes to visit Elizabeth, who was also miraculously pre pregnant with a child, who would become John the Baptist. Mary tells Elizabeth the story of what the angel Gabriel had told her. Elizabeth encourages Mary, and Mary responds with a song. Here it is, Luke chapter 1, 
Mary responded, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary's revolution song, it's called the Magnificat because that's the first word of the song in Latin. It's one of the most famous songs in Christianity, way more famous than All I Want for Christmas. It's, it's been whispered in monasteries, it's been chanted in cathedrals, recited in remote churches by evening candlelight on Christmas Eve, it's set to music by Johann Sebastian Bach. It's a song of praise. I want you to watch. You say, what does this have to do with me? Well, because Mary makes an interesting choice here. And how many know we all have the same choice when we pray? Mary could have focused on what was wrong with her, but instead she focuses on what is right with God. She could have cried, God, why me? But instead she's saying, he has done great things for me. Come on, somebody. Mary praised God in the song. She says, God has chosen me. Did you know God has chosen you? Mary says, God loves me. Did you know that God loves you as well? Mary says, God has remembered me, and God is remembering you this morning. God had mercy on me, Mary said, and God has also had mercy on us. Write this down. The principle is that no matter how bad your circumstances seem, God is still good. No matter how bad your circumstances might be on this Christmas Eve, please remember that God is still good. You know, a few weeks ago, I, I shared a message called Thanks Living. And uh, I received a lot of positive feedback about this message. As a matter of fact, several people told me it was their favorite message of the year. And you remember that I gave the challenge to write down five things every day for 21 days uh, things that you're grateful for, people that you're grateful for, or reasons that you're grateful. Well, a lot of people took the challenge literally and did it. I heard about uh, Micah Garcia. I think he's uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, and he's like every day in his car. You know, he, Pastor Ed was telling me, he goes, he says, Dad, we got we to list five things that we're grateful for. I talked with a family a couple of weeks ago. Their 10-year-old son, Nathaniel, apparently pesters them every day. Mom, 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 we got to write those things down. Pastor Wayne says if we do this for 21 days, something big's going to happen. Listen, as we near the end of 2017, we might look back on the year or our present circumstances, and you could say, why me, God? You could say, why this or why that? But the song that Mary chose to sing wasn't like that at all. It went something like this. Good news of great joy For every woman, every man But this will be a sign to you A baby born in Bethlehem Come and worship And do not be afraid Oh, come and worship Do not be afraid And my soul, my soul It magnifies the Lord My soul, it magnifies the Lord that your song today. He has done great things. He's done great for me. things for me. Great things for me. My soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul, it magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for me. Great things for me. Yeah. If you've got a reason to give God praise today, would you put your hands together and give a song of praise?
song of praise. Christmas is a song of praise. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the second song of Christmas. It's Zechariah's song, which is a song of promise. And because I want to help you in your Scrabble games tomorrow on Christmas Day, it's also called the Benedictus. Let me know, you just get smarter going to church here. Zechariah was an old man. He's Elizabeth's husband, and he's a priest. And the Bible says that they were childless because Elizabeth could not conceive a child. And they were both very old. In Luke chapter 1, the Bible says both of them were righteous in the sight of God, and they observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were faithful to God. They served God faithfully, and, but they didn't get what they wanted from God. They had no child. And there are many people here today that know the type of heartbreak and the type of pain that they probably experienced throughout most of their life. So Zechariah has an encounter with an angel that told him that his wife would have a child. Now, he questioned this because they were both very old. And the angel said, okay, now, because you question this, you're not going to be able to talk until the child is born. And so he could only communicate with hand gestures until after this baby was born. And remember, this baby is John the Baptist. Now, Zechariah's own story is a reflection of what's going on in Israel in this day. Lean in in and listen closely. Remember, prophecy, many believed, had been silent for a long, long time. In fact, for hundreds of years, there had been no word from the Lord. Now it was going to burst out again to lead many back to God. Now, what had begun as a kind of punishment for Zechariah's lack of faith turns into a new sort of sign, a sign that God is doing a new thing. The first words after Zechariah can speak again are the words of a song that we call the Benedictus. And here it is in Luke chapter 1. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy, praise the Lord. The God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he what? Just as he promised. Through his holy prophets long ago, now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. Zechariah immediately connects the birth of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, with this covenant that God had made with Abraham. And remember, this covenant that God made with Abraham had happened 2,000 years previously. And, but there was still such trust and anticipation that God was going to do what he said he would do that Zechariah immediately makes this connection with the promises of God. Write this down on your notes. God doesn't forget his promises, and neither should we. On this Christmas Eve in 2017, I believe that God wanted you to hear this message that God doesn't forget his promises, and neither should we. I want to encourage everyone here today and those watching online, don't give up on the promises of God. If God has spoken to you about a baby or a marriage or a relationship that's going to be restored, if God's given you a dream, if God's spoken to you about, about a career or, 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 or anything else, trust him to bring it to pass. Maybe you're like Zechariah. You've been waiting, 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 waiting for God to fulfill his promise. Today, may you sing this song of Christmas, a song of promise. Oh, come, oh, come,
God, I pray for every person here today and every promise that you've planted in their hearts. I pray that today those promises would be renewed. Faith in those promises would be renewed. Lord, just like Zechariah and Elizabeth, God, you gave them a promise and you brought it to pass. So God, we pray that you'll give us great faith to believe all your promises. All your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Lord, as we enter this new year, may they, these promises be fresh in our hearts, fresh in our minds, that you will do what you said you will do. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Don't you love these songs of Christmas? It's better than Jingle Bell Rock, right? Here's the third one, Simeon's song. It's the song of salvation. The song of salvation. And let's read it in Luke chapter 2. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So that day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, and, and that's what we do around here for baby dedications. We do exactly what Joseph and Mary did. As the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. Say these last three words. Sorry. Go back to the next one. For all people. Would you say it? For all God's salvation is for all people. He is the light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. You know, Simeon had lived in a world of patient hope. Suffering for the people of God during this time had become a way of life. And like Zechariah, he had longed, he had lived long enough to see the oppression of God's people. So what does Simeon sing about at this first Christmas? The Bible says he takes the baby Jesus, the infant Jesus, into his, his arms and he blesses God. And he says, let your servant now depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. And what is that? Access to heaven? Forgiveness of sins? Yes, but much more than that. Simeon says, he is a light to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Listen, Simeon just doesn't just see a child uh, that brings him salvation. He sees a child that will bring the world salvation. You see, I believe when Simeon was holding baby Jesus in his arms, I believe God gave him a picture, yes, of the 12 disciples who would follow him, Matthew and Luke and Philip and all these others, but I believe that God looked, I, th I believe that Simeon could see Emily and John and Amelia and Laura and Jacob and people here today who are going to see the light of Jesus and trust him and follow him. Amen? I believe the principle that we want to take from Simeon's song is that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Simeon's world was dark and, and there was much suffering. And into that world, Jesus shined the light of Christmas. And our, our world, too, is dark. There are many who are hopeless, who are afraid, who are worried or addicted or discouraged or down. And how many know we can sing the same song that Simeon sang, the song of salvation. Jesus is the light of the world. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Sing it with it us. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth.
the line of that song, fall on your knees. I think that is so clearly paints a picture of what salvation truly is. Salvation is about surrender. Remember, Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He came to start a revolution. It's not about believing in Jesus. It's about following Jesus. And here in 2017, I hope today that you can sing the song of salvation. That you can sing the same song that Simeon sang, that Jesus is the light of the world. That behold, my salvation is in Jesus Christ. The scripture says that there is no name given among men under heaven whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. You know why I love Christmas? Because it's about the songs of salvation. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to us. Why would God bother if he did not love us so much? Why would God bother if we weren't so lost? If you're here today and you're not following Jesus and and you're not surrendered to Jesus, I've got some great news. Today can be your song of salvation. Today can be the day that you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus. Perhaps you're the one of the people that Simeon saw way into the future. And on December 24, 2017, it's going to be your spiritual birthday because the day, today's the day that you say, I'm following Jesus. Before we receive communion today, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes all over this room. And I want to lead everyone here in a very simple prayer. You're ready to surrender your heart and life to Jesus. You've tried it your own way. You've tried to add Jesus to your life, but it's just not working. It's about surrender today. If you're ready to surrender your life to Christ and say, I'm turning away from the life that I've been living. I'm trusting Christ to save me. Say this with me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. I agree with you that I've sinned. I'm sorry. I'm guilty. I repent. Please forgive me. I surrender to you as my Lord and Savior. I put my faith in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus to save me because I can't save myself. Holy Spirit, would you give me the power to say yes to Jesus every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You see, Pastor, is it as simple as that? Well, that's the first step, is confessing Jesus and making that decision. And now you take the next step and the next step and the next step. There's all kinds of people here today that will testify that following Jesus is the single greatest decision of your life. And the good news is you're not in this journey alone. We are a family of believers following Jesus together. Amen? And so if that's you today and you prayed to receive Christ just now, I want to encourage you on that connection card. Mark the box that says, I prayed to receive Christ. And then you want to turn it in at the end of the service. We want to pray for you. We're going to pray with you. We just want to encourage you in your faith. You can also go out in the, after the service is over in the hub at the information tent. We would like to give you some resources, a Bible to read, things that will help you in your journey of following Jesus. Because remember, I'm saying it again for the third time, Jesus did not come to start a, a religion. He came to start a revolution. And in your life, amen? Amen. We're going to receive communion together now. So I'd like you to take the communion elements from the chair beside you, if you wouldn't mind. And I want you to take the bread that bread in your hand. Lord, we give thanks. We thank you, Lord, for this bread that represents your body. We thank you, Lord, for the love that this represents. You gave yourself for us. On this Christmas season, we thank you. We remember. We sing your song of salvation. 
receive it together. Now we give thanks for this cup that represents the greatest gift of all time, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you, Lord, this Christmas that you loved us so much that you came to where we are because we could not save ourselves. And God, we receive this cup with thanksgiving, with praise, in recognition that there will be a day soon that we will all gather around that great banqueting table in heaven and celebrate this Lord's Supper with you. Until you come, we remember you. Receive the cup together. One more song in the Christmas story. I know some of you saw that fourth blank and you're starting to OCD. We got one more blank, Pastor, one more blank. All right, here it is. The angel's song is the song of peace. The angel's song, the song of peace. Luke chapter two, verse 13. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. These angels sing this hymn to the shepherds, and they only understand it in context of the Old Testament because, listen, peace on earth is not some lefty pipe dream. Come on. And, and, and the angels weren't talking about, it's a, it's a promise of peace for Israel. It's a promise of peace for the nations. I love what Martin Luther King Jr. said, peace is not the absence of tension or conflict, it's the presence of justice. That's right. I want you to think about that. It's not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of justice. It's a person. See, that's the kind of peace that the angels were singing about. They're not envisioning this flower-filled meadows where the shepherds can just dance and everything is good. When the angels sing peace on earth, they're proclaiming that Jesus is coming to make things right. He's coming to restore the order that God had originally attended in Eden. He's coming to right wrongs. When the angels sing, they echo the same song that Mary sang, that everything's going to be flipped around. Everything is going to be reversed. And they're saying things are going to be different now because of Jesus. Here's the principle from the angel's song. Jesus will not only make things peaceful, he's going to make things right. Man, I wish I was in the right church today. You were about to enter a new year, right? 2018, and perhaps it will be the year that the Lord Jesus returns for his church. Perhaps it will be even before this year is over. But until then, we have the promise of the angels that when he comes, he will bring peace with him. He will make things right. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's why we can sing the song of peace. That's why we can sing at Christmas, silent night, O holy night, because peace is a person. His name is Jesus. Would you stand with me? You've been given a candle. When you came in today, I'd like you to go ahead and light that candle. And for the next few moments, let's reflect on the song of peace.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May Christmas be filled with songs, songs of praise, songs of peace, songs of promise, and most of all, songs of salvation. May you have angels around you if you travel. May the Spirit of the Lord be with you in every gathering that you have with family and friends. May the Lord make up the difference for those who are having gatherings without loved ones for the very first time. May the Spirit of Jesus Christ go with you. I bless you in Jesus' name. Go with God. We love you very much. Merry Christmas.